Hello. Hey, everybody. Thank you for coming on such a beautiful day. We appreciate you guys coming out. Tonight, we're going to have a little bit of a different program. Usually, you guys know that we do trivia. Well, we're not doing that tonight. And the reason is, is because it's been a year since we've been a nonprofit. And I want to take the time tonight to thank some of the people that have been involved with the Science Pub and don't always get the recognition because they're a little bit behind the scenes. So if I could get all the board members of the Science Pub up on stage, please. This is a first for you guys, huh? <laughs> Surprise. Uh, if you want to sing and dance, yes. Fine. Um, what I did is I printed up some certificates of appreciation for each one of these guys. They work really hard at making these programs, and I just wanted them to have something to take home, to put on their walls so that, you know, they can be proud of what they're doing here. So, James... Dale, Eric, Madeline, Karen, and Heather. So if you guys wouldn't mind giving these guys a round of applause. I just want you guys to know how much I appreciate your help. You guys um, made this happen. Without you, none of this would happen every month. And we really appreciate it. So thank you guys very much. And Science Club would have ended if the previous group who got fatigued of doing it and announced, well, this will be the last science pub. And then this guy, Dan, said, anybody who's interested in keeping science pub going, come and talk to me. So round of applause for Dan. So the other thing I want to do, I don't know if you guys are aware, I'm pretty sure you are because I announce it every time, but we have sponsors for the science pub that help put us on. And two of those sponsors is obviously the Taproot and Alaska Commons. So I was hoping that uh, Evan, if you could come up on stage here. <laughs> so Evan is the events director at the Taproot. He kind of does all of the organizing with us. He's the contact person for the Science Pub. So we just wanted to present the Taproot with this certificate of thanks. We really appreciate everything you guys do for us. I mean, not only that they give us the space for free, guys, but they give us drink tokens for the organizers, and they give gift certificates to the presenters, and they advertise for us online, and they put up posters, they feed us, like, so they do a really amazing job, so thank you very much, Tabaru, and all the servers, thank you guys for everything you do. Next, I was hoping I could get Alaska Commons up here, if you're on the board. I haven't been on the board, right? No, I can't. So this is Heather and John from Alaska Commons. They have been with Science Pub since pretty much the beginning, right? Like, yeah. And they post all our videos online. They do a whole bunch of advertising and promotion for us. They take care of all of our website, all the technical stuff. So we just wanted to present you with a certificate of thanks, guys. We really appreciate what you do. Thank you. So don't leave right after the show because we're doing something special tonight as long, along with the certificates. We're going to be having some live music for you guys to thank you guys for coming to these events and the donations that you give and everything you do. So right around 5, 5.15, we're going to have a singer, and we also got some cake. And I just want to let you know that the only thing that we spent money on as far as out of donations 
was on half of the price of the cake. The rest of it came from the board members. We paid for that, the entertainment. So we're not spending the donations on entertainment, but we did that for you guys. So now I'm going to bring up our speaker for the evening. Ivan Hodes is a deputy director of Friends of Nike Site Summit. He teaches elementary school at Elmendorf Air Force Base and previously taught on the former U.S. Navy base on Adak Island, as well as A.J. Diamond High School. He holds a B.A. in History from the United States Military Academy and is a veteran of Operation Enduring Freedom. Oh, I am so sorry. My bad. <laughs> so if you guys would please give a warm welcome to Ivan.
things were different. Um, the Cold War for reasons that will become clear required or was thought to require the um, creation of a large permanent standing military with a large permanent <coughs> military infrastructure. And that was no more, more, more true than here in Alaska. Uh, the United States military basically built, uh, built an empire of technology um, because Alaska was in the front lines of the Cold War. In the event of a Soviet attack, uh, the Soviets would have to come either through Alaska or through Alaskan airspace. So um, everywhere from the Arctic coast to the remotest uh, villages of the interior, uh, to the farthest Aleutians, that's ADAC, uh, to right here in Anchorage, um, the military was everywhere. They, they stayed here for 40 years, and then they left. Um, there is obviously still a military presence here in Alaska, but it's pretty concentrated in Anchorage, in Fairbanks, and over at Delta Duncan in Greeley. Um, but during the Cold War, um, these structures were all, all over the place. And then when the Cold War ended, they just kind of got abandoned. So um, if an archaeologist from the far future was excavating in Alaska, um, it would kind of look like this alien race descended on Alaska, built up a high-tech military outpost, ran for 40 years, and then abandoned. So what we're looking at basically is what were these structures? Um, why were they built? How did they work? Um, and what was the science behind it? So with that humanities history introduction out of the way, we'll get to the, the, the science behind it. So when I was in the Army, um, I was an infantry guy, and I used to say that there were really only two jobs in the Army, um, infantry and infantry which meant that the basic mission of the army is um, thought to be taking over and holding territory. So the infantry guys are the ones that do that. Everybody else just enables that, enables us to accomplish the mission. From the artillery people to the logisticians, the radar technicians, um, there was sort of the central, central mission. That may be true some of the time, but it definitely was not true in the Cold War. In the Cold War, everything was about nuclear weapons. Dropping nuclear weapons on other people and stopping them from dropping them on you. Um, so, it's important to understand the technology of the nuclear weapon because that is what made the Cold War so different than any other conflict that had never been fought because nuclear weapons are so different than any other technology, any other military technology um, that had uh, previously been used. So here's why. we got to go inside of the atom. Our friend, Mr. Adam. So most of you probably know um, that the, um, that the atom is made of three basic particles. Um, there's a small, positively charged region in the center <coughs> made of protons and neutrons. There is a much larger, um, but much less massive, negatively charged um, region, the electron. Phil will have much more, more to say about electrons in a bit, um, but we are talking about nukes, so we're, so we're talking about inside the nucleus. So in the early 20th century, um, physicists had figured out that there was this um, region of a positive charge in the center of the atom. Um, but that sort of that sort of created a, a mystery question. If if there's all this positive charge, and it turned out there, there were these individual particles, protons, that had positive charge, um, and they're all close together inside the nucleus, why don't they fall apart? Or why don't they push each other apart? Because they have the same electrical charge, right? And things with like charges repel. So what's keeping them together? And it turns out it's the it's the neutron. Um, so in the same way that matter has a characteristic called mass, um, which which causes everything with mass to pull and everything else with mass, and in the same way that matter has a characteristic called charge, which causes things with like charge to to repel and opposite charge to attract. Right? There's another characteristic of matter um, that protons and neutrons both have called color. It's not actually color. Um, it's just what physicists call it um, because they couldn't think of anything else to call it, um, and because there are sort of three varieties of it um, that interact in various complicated ways, which I don't really understand, so I won't get into. But the end result is that protons and neutrons, through the interaction of what is called a strong nuclear force, which is induced by color the same way that um, electrical pull or uh, magnetic attraction or repulsion is induced by, uh, by charge. Um, so the strong nuclear force causes the proton and the neutron to um, to stick together. So you can think of the nucleus as kind of being like like the glue, or excuse me, the neutron is the glue that holds the, the nucleus together. Um, so the strong nuclear force is in fact very, very strong. 
uh, its own length, but it also only works over very, very short distances. So as the nucleus gets bigger and bigger, as you start adding more and more protons and neutrons, um, you start reaching the limit of the of the strong nuclear force. Um, there's a distance beyond which the strong nuclear force can't hold all that stuff together and it falls apart. So there's an upper limit to the size of, uh, of, an, of an atom. It turns out to be uranium. Uranium is the biggest, the biggest um, atom nucleus that can occur in anything like large numbers in nature. Um, and what that means is that it's got a lot of what you can think of as potential energy. So if you sort of think of all of the, all of the lighter elements being at the bottom of a slope, and as you go up, you're going up the slope. Uranium is kind of perched at the top, um, and on the other side of the slope, there's like a cliff. So if you just push it a little bit, if you add a little bit of energy to it, it falls off the cliff, it drops, and, it's, and it drops so far and so fast that it breaks in half. Um, that is, in fact, what can happen um, if you bombard a uranium nucleus, a particular variety of an isotope called uranium-235. If you bombard it with, with um, fast neutrons, which um, people figured out how to do in the 30s, uh, you can actually split it in half. Um, it breaks into um, two nuclei roughly of equal size. Um, there are a couple different nuclei that can come out when you do it. And it turns out that in addition to these two nuclei being um, formed from, from the one, so nuclear fission, right, um, the nucleus breaks in half. In addition to the two smaller nuclei, it also produces two high-speed um, neutrons, one, one sort of associated with each um, with each fission product. And those neutrons, um, if there is another uranium-235 atom in, in the vicinity, can, can hit those atoms. They all break apart. So now, instead of two free neutrons, there are four. And then the next time it happens, there are eight, and then 16, and then 32, and then 64. So if you get a sufficient number of uranium-235 atoms all together, a critical mass, you might say, um, then it can create a nuclear chain reaction. Um, this is actually the conversion of matter into pure energy, just like Einstein said, and it turns out that a very small amount of matter um, generates huge amounts of energy. So this is tens of thousands of times more powerful than any conventional fluid, and that's why it's so dangerous. So if you do this um, in a controlled way, you get civilian nuclear power. If you just sort of let it go out of control, you get that. <laughs> but it gets worse. So not only can you um, basically destroy an entire city with, um, with just a couple thousand pounds, sometimes less, of, um, of nuclear material, um, you can render it uninhabitable, you will render it uninhabitable for the next several years because um, these fission products that, um, that get created are themselves unstable, they are themselves radioactive. What radioactivity means basically is that um, the configuration of protons and neutrons in the atom doesn't quite work. Um, and through a fourth, even more obscure force called the weak nuclear force, a proton can actually turn into a neutron and vice versa um, when they're unstable um, and in the process ejects a high speed electron, which is called a beta particle, or it can kick out the equivalent of a helium nucleus called an alpha particle, or it can emit pure radiation, which is called a gamma, or called a gamma ray. Um, so all of those things do terrible, terrible damage. Um, if you sort of think of a piece of shrapnel or a low caliber bullet sort of, sort of spinning and tumbling around inside the human body, tearing up tissue, um, these things basically do that, these um, radioactive products do that, except at the atomic level, so breaking up the, um, they're breaking up the bonds between the complex biomolecules inside of, inside of living things, uh, causing radiation poisoning um, and, and things like that. So all in all, we're doing really bad, um, most particularly. Um, and, and the reason it's so bad is because this effect sticks around. Um, all of these radioactive materials have what is called a half-life. The half-life is basically how long it takes, of a given amount of nuclear of radioactive material, how long it takes half of that to decay into whatever it, it becomes next. It eventually becomes something stable. And in the process, it's giving off all, all, all this dangerous radiation. Um, so the ones that are really dangerous are the ones that have sort of a medium half-life. One things with really, really long half-lives um, aren't emitting that much radiation in a given period of time, so they're kind of safe. If it's a really short half-life, it's extremely dangerous while well, it happens, but it goes away pretty soon. Things with half-lives of like 60, 80, 100 years are the bad ones because they are active enough to cause a lot of damage, but they stick around long enough to continue to cause damage. So when you have to drop a nuclear bomb on a city, not only does it destroy it, um, it um, makes the environment poisonous for, for many years because the, the because these little 
um, fission products get carried up into the air by the heat of the explosion, and because they're heavy, they eventually fall out. So that's nuclear fallout. Um, that's why uh, nuclear weapons uh, are so dangerous in particular. Um, strontium is one of the fission products, and it's chemically very, very similar to calcium. So it actually can get uh, taken up in the body. Um, it becomes part of the skeletal structure and does its radioactive damage from inside your own skeleton. So all in all, really quite bad news. But it gets even worse. Uh, even more energetic than uh, a reaction than the nuclear fission reaction is fusion. Fusion is where you take two light nuclei and fuse them together. Ordinarily, the electromagnetic repulsion between atoms stops them from doing that. But if you get sufficient um, speed, which means sufficient temperature and sufficient pressure, you can actually overcome the electromagnetic force, and they stick together through the strong nuclear force, and in the process, release many, many, many more times of, uh, more energy than in fission, which is itself many, many more times powerful than anything chemical. So ordinarily, you need something like the inside of a star to create this um, this amount of heat and pressure. But it turns out that nuclear fusion creates enough of it that you can that you can set it off. So if, in addition to your um, uranium, you have some lithium, uh, lithium will split into various varieties of hydrogen. The hydrogen will fuse together to make helium. So if you have a lot of lithium or what's called heavy hydrogen um, in your nuclear bomb, you can create a fusion bomb. And that looks like this. So the good news is, um, the good news about nuclear weapons is they're kind of hard to make. Um, you need, among other things, access to a large amount of uranium ore. You have to be able to refine the uranium. You have to enrich it um, into the fissionable variety, um, or you have to make plutonium. Um, so all in all, it's, uh, in order to do it, you have to be a very highly industrialized country with a lot of resources and a lot of scientific expertise and the willingness to do it. So only a few countries were willing and able to do it. The bad news is one of them was the Soviet Union. The other bad news is that once you make the first one, the next thousand or so become much easier to make, right? Because you've already got the, the industrial plant created. Um, you already have developed the technical expertise. So once the, the Soviet Union developed their own nuclear weapons, uh, they started making many, many, many of them in Soviet Union. Um, it's not enough to have to just have nuclear weapons, you have to have a way to deliver them. So basically, if you get a nuclear weapon and a way to deliver it to the enemy territory, you get little kids having to uh, hide under their desks, um, hide under their desks because of fears of a nuclear strike. Does anybody remember doing this as a kid? Yeah. Um, so, Because, it was, because there were so many of these nukes, and, and because so many of them, uh, and because they were each so dangerous, um, each of these two countries in the Cold War had to come up with some kind of system of dealing with it. And the strategy that they both hit on was just having so many of them that if the other side attacked you, you would still have enough capacity left over to launch a retaliatory strike and do as much damage to them as you did, as they did to you. So nobody would be willing to, to launch that first strike. And that is the doctrine theory of mutually assured destruction. Um, it sounds kind of crazy, but on the other hand, it worked. Um, so in order for it to work, though, not only do you need a lot of weapons, you need to disperse your delivery head. You have to have different means of delivering these warheads to enemy targets, and you have to have different means of stopping the ones that are coming, ones that are coming in. Um, so this is called the nuclear triad, the means of delivering these weapons, um, weapon systems. So, uh, one, one is by sea, um, which basically means submarines surfacing and launching um, nuclear weapons from the ocean. By land, um, which is just um, launch sites in your home territory. Um, and finally, um, historically the first, we'll have to talk about it last because it's kind of the most complicated by air, being flying an airplane over your enemy city and just dropping a, a bomb from the, uh, the building. And now you know more about nuclear, nuclear strategy than Donald Trump. <laughs> okay, so, so the other thing you have to understand is this idea called strategic depth. So you can kind of picture Cold War America as the home of a paranoid suburbanite, which in many ways it actually was. Um, so 
So if you're trying to figure out what's going on, you want to have like security cameras pointed out into the neighborhood so you can figure out what's going on. You want to have a big fence, like, you want a big yard with an attack dog, um, and then the most valuable stuff you're keeping inside the house, right? You want some close range protection, so like a guy standing in the door with a shotgun. So in this analogy, American cities and nuclear launch facilities were the jewels inside of the house. So there were these layers of protection um, that were set up to defend against a, um, an incoming attack. So let's talk about each of these different lights. We'll start with kind of the simplest one, which is land-based systems. Um, so this is a diagram of Soviet missile site. So basically, um, this, is, this is just a giant rocket. Um, everybody, I think, probably understands rockets. Um, you, you have some propellant, so, so fuel, um, and a way to burn it. Unlike your car engine, you uh, rockets have to carry their own um, oxidizer with them. So, so so something to burn and something to burn it with. Um, that is down in the, the belly of this rocket. If you get enough of that and you make your um, and you make the rocket light enough, you can launch it really, really fast and really, really far. Uh, because what happens when it burns? Um, you get you get a bunch of hot gases pushing down this way. And Isaac Newton told us that any for any reaction there's an equal opposite reaction. So the gas is pushing down this way. Um, cause an equal reaction pushing up that way, and that makes the rocket um, go. And and if you build it big enough, you can launch a missile from Kazakhstan and hit a target in Nebraska, or vice versa. Um, so there were never any land-based um, nukes in Alaska. Um, we tended to keep them as close to the center of the United States as possible, because again, they're the valuable assets. You want them far away and um, pr protected by all this uh, strategic depth. There were nukes in Alaska, um, big ones just for testing purposes out on Amchitka Island. Um, University of Alaska Fairbanks and the military did three underground nuclear tests. Above ground tests have been banned um, because of the fallout thing. If you do it underground, the, all the radioactive materials is, is down in the ground. It doesn't um, become as hazardous. So there were some tests done in the 60s and 70s um, in Alaska, but no, um, but no silos. Um, no big intercontinental ballistic missiles here in Alaska. Um, so that leads us then to the defenses. So again, in the analogy, we're thinking about the cameras looking around the neighborhood. Um, so what we had for that was surveillance planes. So um, we had the U-2. Not this one. <laughs> this. Um, these were mostly based out of Eielson Air Force Base up in Fairbanks. They were just big. Um, very, very large, high-flying planes that could fly over Soviet territory, hopefully without getting shot down. It only happened once. Um, but basically looking for these silos. They're kind of hard, hard to, dis to um, disguise because um, they have to be pretty big. Um, so once you locate one, um, you can then sort of train some radars on it and figure out what's going on. So, um, so once you identify these sites, then you put radar on them. And, that, and the radar is sort of like the sort of like the fence. So if something happens, if they start moving towards you, you're going to know about it. So this is like my favorite piece of Cold War um, infrastructure, and it has the coolest name, Cobra Dane. This is out on Shemya Island, and it's basically just a giant, giant, giant radar. Um, and um, this is also a giant, giant radar system. This is out at Clear Air Force Base um, over by Healy. This is called BMUs, or Ballistic Missile Early Warning System. So all both of these two systems are just really big radars. They have to be big because you're looking all the way into Russia. So I don't know a whole lot about um, radar technology. Fortunately, I brought along a guy who is a retired radar technician. Um, so Phil is going to explain a little bit of the science behind radar.
Uh, Ivan uh, asked me to uh, uh, give a little talk here on radar this evening, and uh, he told me he wanted me to start with the atom and go to RF energy, and I'm thinking, boy, that's, that's a several week ordeal, but uh, <laughs> I've kind of compacted this into something that maybe we can get through in a few minutes. But when you get your flyer, if you look at the very back page, you'll see a picture of a radar above the treetops, and that's what was above the trees over at Kincaid Park. That tower stood there until the early 80s uh, when it was finally taken down. If you look at the diagram underneath that, you'll see what is a picture of a FAA radar that is similar to what was in that tower. That tower was a classified radar, so I was not able to find a picture of it, but it was a dual system. It had what was called an ECCM capability, electronic counter countermeasure capability. So it actually had more components to it and was a little more sophisticated than what that FAA radar depicts in that diagram. That diagram shows uh, two radars working back to back through one antenna. But it's designed to go through a waveguide switch so you only use one side at a time. One side's running while the other side's down for maintenance. That way the FAA has a radar online 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The military had what they called a diaplex mode, which allowed you to work both of those radars through that antenna at the same time, and they were timed one nanosecond apart. And that was an ECCM capability that if the Russians decide to jam one side, it was difficult for them to jam the other because the other side was working at a different frequency. So that was one of the advantages to that radar. There were only two of them ever um, put in the system. One was here and one was in Hawaii. And I just happened to be lucky enough to get schooled on this radar and babysit it for over three years. I became pretty intimate with it, uh, sleeping with it, eating with it and just about everything else. Uh, so I was quite proud of it. It, uh, it functioned quite well. As we know that if you're going to deal with electrons, and of course starting with the atom, we look at the fact that it has neutrons, protons, electrons, and of course the electrons is what we're interested in because we want to move current. We want to generate electricity. And the uh, movement of, of electrons from a negative to a positive point by an EMF, by electromotive force, is where we develop our voltages and our current and produce uh, these systems that generate electricity. The three main things that we need in order to generate uh, an AC mechanical power is we need a good conductor, we need a magnetic field, and we need relative motion. This is going to give us an AC. There are DC generators, but DC does not transmit over long distances. In fact, Tesla uh, finally convinced the rest of the world that that's what was needed because uh, Edison was trying to install DC power in New York City and he'd have to have a generator like every block because DC does just not transmit over long distances. So in looking at your fire pit, this AC power that we're going to generate to power our electronic systems comes out of a power plant and if you look at the picture on the upper right hand part of the flyer, you'll see the output of a power generation station. It's going to give us an output of three phase, 60 cycle or 60 hertz at some amount of voltage. The voltage, believe it or not, is not that critical. The power companies do monitor their output, but it can be at different sizes. And, it, and they're not really that concerned about whether it's two or three volts off. What they monitor most critically, believe it or not, is that 60 cycle. 
that 60 cycle frequency is critical because it's it sets timers in industry. Even your clock you plug into the wall, that clock runs off of that 60 hertz or that 60 cycles. And if that cycle falls below its normal run, let's say that a 60 cycle motor gets hit with 50 cycles, it's probably going to fail because it's going to slow down, it's going to overheat. So that 60 cycle is extremely critical. So whenever the power company monitors their output, they actually look at the frequency more than they do the voltage. Now that three-phase power comes out of that power company and it's divided up. If it's going to commercial building, all three phases are going to probably be used in that commercial building, so they're going to get three-phase power. But at your home, at your residence, you're only going to have a single phase. So to keep the power output balanced, they send one phase through one neighborhood, they send another phase to another neighborhood, and again, the third phase goes to another neighborhood. That way, that power generation station stays balanced. So when you get power at your house, you're getting 220 volts single phase that's center tapped to give you 110 volts at your outlet. Now, if you monitor that three phase coming out of that power plant, in fact, if you look at that diagram, I don't know whether you can read that or not, they're showing it at 208 volts because they're monitoring it line to line. In other words, each one of those phases is 90 degrees out of phase with the other. So you're going to get a shift in phase and your voltage is going to be different, plus the fact that the usable voltage is not the peak voltage. It's what they call an RMS, root mean square, which is 0.707 of that peak. So when you're reading 110 volts at your outlet, you're reading the RMS value of what's coming out of that power plant. And of course, that for the homeowner is not that critical. But when you're dealing with industry, it is. Because some of these peak voltages are used in industry. So we need to know what they are when we start using them in power supplies. Now, when we bring AC power into our home and we plug a computer into it or we want to use it in uh, sophisticated equipment, we need to rectify it. This diagram he has up here now shows a full wave rectifier. And as you can see, the pulsating power coming out of that uh, rectifier is a pulsating voltage that through the filter network on the end of it, that capacitor resistance, changes it to a steady DC. And if you look at your uh, flyer again at the upper left-hand corner, you'll see how that is depicted in converting AC power to DC power. And the, the other waveform down at the bottom talks about the RMS of 0.707 being the working part of that waveform. Now this is an example of a small power supply that's come out of a desktop computer. So it takes AC power, plugs it into your wall, and it converts that AC power to all these DC voltages that's used inside your computer. Most of your equipment in your home, your television, and all of the other things that you use, computers, are converted to DC voltages once they get inside your home. Now, for those of you that like to work on your own stuff, in today's world, you can generally buy yourself a digital voltmeter, which you can pretty much test all the circuitry that you have in your home. Whereas in the older days, when before digital voltmeters, meters had a sensitivity. In other words, when you put a voltmeter uh, across the circuit, you actually can change the resistance of that circuit. So we had to use voltmeters that were 
that had a high impedance, and they were called VTBMs, vacuum tube voltmeters. And as, as you can see, this compared to the new one today is quite a bit bigger, plus the fact that it had vacuum tubes in it. But it had a high impedance to it, so it wouldn't load the circuit. Because if you were to put a voltmeter in that circuit that had a sensitivity of say 10,000 ohms per volt or less, it would look like a, a resistor and the current would change in that circuit and if you had a one watt resistor in that circuit and all of a sudden you've got two watts in it, you're going to let the smoke out of it. So you had to be careful with the type of voltmeter that you used. Of course, this is what a, a, a new digital type low meter looks. You can see the, the size and this has like a one mega sensitivity, so it really doesn't load a circuit. So you can pretty much use this meter anywhere. But you do need to realize that if you're going to work on something that has sensitive circuits in it, you need to have a good meter. Now, from here, we're going to we're going to talk a little bit about the power coming into a Nike site. The Nike system was designed to be mobile. So you had three phase power, 60 hertz, coming into the Nike site. That site was designed, as I said, to be mobile, so we changed the frequency from 60 to 400. The higher that frequency, the smaller the components can be. So to make this site mobile, they upped the frequency, we sent that AC input power through converters and brought it up to 400 cycle. So we had essentially 208 volts, three phase, 400 cycle, feeding the Nike her missile, missile system or the radars, the radars and their computers. Bear with me. Now that particular system that I mentioned earlier had magnetrons and amplitrons in it. A magnetron is an RF oscillator. When it's excited with a high voltage, it will generate a uh, pulse of RF energy. Uh, this is the interior of a uh, magnetron that's referred to as a cabinet magnetron. This allowed, magnet, uh, this allowed RF transmitters to be made smaller and can be used in aircraft. This center, this disc with these uh, cavities in it, was made out of beryllium which has a lot of free electrons. The cathode when it got excited, it would emit electrons that intermingled with these free electrons in this beryllium, and it went into resonance. And that resonance produced RF energy. And of course, RF energy being that it, it's a magnetic energy, this tube was surrounded by large magnets, which made things kind of tricky when you're working on it, because you got to work on it. And even if it's shut down, these magnets are still, they're permanent magnets. You, you'd end up losing tools. I'd been in there working around a magnet before, and all of a sudden, I mean, it would just snatch the tool right out of your hand, and of course, it would put it up in a location where you couldn't get to it. You'd have to disassemble the whole equipment just to get to the damn thing, and you obviously can't leave it in there. Right, and then you got some real problems. But these magnets are so powerful, they'll take the tool right out of your hand. To this day, I don't wear any jewelry. I've been married for 49 years, and my wife is understanding. She knows that I can't go in there with any jewelry on. And a watch, you talk about trashing a watch. I mean, it's junk the minute you open that door. So these magnetrons and amplitrons are surrounded by large magnets. Well, I don't want to show the magnets. Yeah, great. Now this here, this is a magnetron, and this is the 
tube portion, and this is the magnet that I'm talking about. Now, this is the Kleist rod, which is a more powerful transmitter, but it also has magnets. And we'll talk a little bit more about these Kleist rods. This was surrounded by two four to five inches of lead. essentially what the FAA was using in this particular radar. Now the Mackey system had several radars and all of them but one used a magnetron. The high power radar used a klystron. Klystrons are, are used in high power radars. They generate a tremendous amount of energy. And the tower on the right hand side would have been a high power radar. He was trying to find it. Well, that's that's the low power radar. That's the low power acquisition radar that was used with the Nike system. Uh, the Nike system had two acquisition radars. These are search radars. They give you range and azimuth. And of course, this particular radar here had a range of about 250,000 yards. And the high power radar had a range of uh, 350,000 yards, about 175 miles. A lot of people ask me the fact that, well, that's not very long. I mean, 200 miles, I mean, 175 nautical miles, that's not very far. You have to take in the curvature of the Earth. Uh, these BU's radars that he showed you earlier, they were what they called backscatter. They could actually bounce the RF energy off of the ionosphere in what they call a knife effect that could actually see around the curvature of the Earth. But these radars here did not have that capability. They were designed to look for bombers, not for ICBMs. So the curvature of the Earth limited to what these radars could do. Uh, the, the way a radar functions, now these radars were pulse radars. Uh, as you can probably see, Ivan and I aren't really too coordinated on this right yet. But uh, the, the radars that the Nike Hertz missile system used were pulse radars. They would send out a pulse, a burst of energy for two microseconds. Then they would listen for 2,498. And during that listening time was when the target should show up because the pulse would go out, it would bounce off of a target, and return back to the radar. And during that listening time would give you the distance to that target. And that's how the range was determined. Now, radars have a blind speed. A plane can actually be flying at a speed that the radar won't see. So we would stagger these PRFs, these pulses. And so the military radars had these staggered capabilities. They also had what they called an MTI, a moving target indicator. They would take a transmitter signal, wait for a return, and then he would compare it with another return. And if there was a difference, algebraically, they would produce a signal to where you could see a target moving through a cloud. Whereas in a lot of cases, if you didn't have an MTI, that cloud would be more visible than the target that's moving through it. So there was several receiver circuits that improved your target resolution. On the same page where this amplitron is, this shows you and, and the uh, inside of the amplitron where 
the RF energy would come in, be amplified, and sent out the back. The lower picture here is that of a klystron. Now, these klystrons generate a tremendous amount of power. And of course, along with that, they produce a lot of side energy. And they require higher voltages and more complicated circuitry. They would take a crystal, if you look at that first page again, down in the lower right hand corner, that's a crystal that generates milliwatts of power. Very little power. It's like the crystal you, some of your older radios use crystals. Uh, you'll find crystals in your watches, crystals in a lot of different places. This little crystal would generate a milliwatt of power, it would sit over, be sent over to what they call a traveling wave tube. It would come out of that traveling wave tube at five watts. It would go to the klystron at five watts, but it would come out of that klystron tube at 10 million watts. That was the amplification that that little crystal got coming out of that klystron. And if you talk about cooking a turkey, you could fix your turkey in a hurry on that, let me tell you. Modified Advanced Underwater Weapons. 
um, but they were nuclear weapons. This is the facility where they were assembled, known, known locally on ADAC as the Southern Doors of Doom. Um, there was also a lot of stuff um, on ADAC dedicated to stopping, or at least um, finding these submarines. With the good thing about submarines is that you can um, you can destroy them pretty easily. If you find them, the trouble was finding them. So a lot of ways, this is the most dangerous of the likes um, because the ocean is big, it's deep. Um, submarines are small, so it's really, really hard to find a submarine in the ocean, but there was a lot of technology um, for that. So um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip a little bit of details, but basically um, there are ways to do it using sonar and sound detection um, and triangulation. Um, there are ways to do basically the same thing with radio signals. Um, basically, you, if you get radio signals coming from different directions uh, or sound, sound signals, you can figure out the distance and direction and pinpoint the location. So with sonar, we can get them. With radio, we can get them. Um, this is what's called a circular disposed antenna array. Just a bunch of giant antennas all in a row. If you've ever flown over or um, driven through Elmendor Air Force Base, this is the elephant cage which is currently in operation, so that we can't talk about. But you can infer that if um, structures have, or facilities have similar structures, they have the same function. Everybody with me? OK. Um, so, um, so by sonar, by radio, by various other means, we could figure out where these submarines were. And then we could send out the attack dogs. The attack dogs, in, uh, in this case, were um, were, were called patrons, patrol squadrons, planes that would um, do patrols over the North Pacific. This is an E3, excuse me, P3 Orion flying over, flying past the ADAC. It also has some electronics in its tail um, sticking out there. It's called a stinger. They could detect submarines. When they found them, um, they could um, drop various weapons on them. Never did come to that. They could also drop what are called sonar buoys, um, which are even or sort of shorter range sonar systems that could continue to pinpoint the location so these submarines could be tracked basically for every mile of their voyage and in the event that things were going badly, um, they could be stopped. But again, um, any, any time the offensive weapon was a missile, once it was launched, there's no way to stop it. Um, with, with the air system, though, um, you could do that. Um, so with the air system, again, the early warning is radar. So there is this line of radars all along the Arctic coast of Alaska and Canada called the Q-Line, due for just an early warning. So if a Soviet bomber was flying overhead, it would get picked up. It would get communicated by the White House to um, the headquarters, and they would then have a few hours, about three hours of flight time to do something about it. So the first thing they would try to do is just First thing they tried to do was just shoot stuff down with, um, with fighter jets. There was a string of Air, Air Force bases in the interior in the Cold War, sort of the main one at Isleson, and there were smaller ones at King Salmon, at Galena, and a couple other spots. So they tried to shoot down all these bombers before they got close. When they got close, you, you're down to the guy sending the drone with a shotgun, and the shotgun was Nike. Um, so Nike Hercules was an air defense system. Um, they were located actually not just in Alaska, but in most major American cities. Here in Alaska, there were five in Fairbanks, three in Anchorage. One is in what is now Kincaid Park. One is up in the mountain. That's the one we did the tours of. And there's one across um, across the bay over in the general vicinity of the Point McKenzie um, Prison Park. Um, so each one was divided into two halves. There was a half where the anti-aircraft missiles were launched were from, and there was a half with all the radar that built on that. These two halves were in communication with each other electronically, um, and um, they used radar and early computing to actually guide these um, missiles onto or near the target. So Phil, are you going to talk about some details of the Nike? Uh, this first picture here depicts the fact that the Nike system could be used as a surface-to-surface. -surface. Its main mission was surface-to-air, but it did have a surface-to-surface -surface capability. The, uh, the Nike used both HE and nuclear warheads. Uh, the, uh, the W-31 warhead was a nuclear warhead, and it was designed for formations of aircraft. So uh, most surface-to-surface -surface shots would have probably been uh, an HG shot, but they did use the HG warhead uh, for surface to air also. 
the way the surface-to-surface work is that a, the, the duty officer using logarithmic tables would program the computer, launch the missile, the MTR, which is called the missile tracking radar that they're showing on the left, uh, just to the right of the missile, that radar would guide that missile to that kill point using the, uh, the computer uh, from the logarithmic tables that the duty officer would have put into that missile, or in, into the computer that the computer tells the MTR, the missile tracking radar, where to guide the missile. And essentially, in the surface to air, it kind of works the same way, except you're using uh, a bunch of radars uh, through the computer to also determine the kill point. And looking at this, uh, and of course the launcher being on your left, the first radar that they're showing just to the right of the missile is the MTR, the missile tracking radar. The computer system is shown next. Then the target ranging radar, which is an ECM radar. If the incoming formation of aircraft, because when you're being attacked by formations of bombers, in that bomber group is going to be an ECM officer. He's going to have a jammer. He's going to try to put you out of action. So he's going to try to jam your radars. So the TRR is a counter to that. It's a ECCM radar. It actually had two different magnetrons that worked up two different frequencies. That was operated by the TTR supervisor. The, okay, uh, well that's an ECM console for, for the ACT radar. The, M, the, the one on your lower left here is the uh, console for the MTR operator. He's the one that operates the radar controlling the missile. The picture above that is where the duty officer would set with the two acquisition operators. The one on the far right is the ECCM console that was used with uh, the particular radar that I worked on. It had four different receivers, uh, so you had a lot of different video to, to look at. And of course that radar had two of everything, so you could intermingle those four receivers from one side to the four receivers on the other side for a total of eight, and you could get a picture that was uh, clear of jamming. The um, target tracking radar, we don't have a picture of the target track. Well, okay. The target tracking radar was a radar that would first acquire the target as far as tracking goes. The two acquisition radars, the high par and the low par, would first spot the target. Once it was identified as a friend or a foe, because these two radars had a friend or foe identification feature, once they were identified as a foe, then that data would be sent to the TTR, which is the first radar to the left of that low power radar. That, the operators, there were three operators at that TTR, that would automatically go to the range and azimuth of that target, but the elevator operator had to find it because the acquisition radars don't give you elevation. So that elevator operator had to be quick. He had to find that target. The minute he found it, then he could lock onto it and send that information over to the computer. The computer then would make determine a kill point for that aircraft or formations of aircraft to be uh, met with the missile they would determine a kill point for that missile uh, to that aircraft. And that's essentially how the Nike system worked. It was a um, uh, solid propellant system. Uh, the Ajax system, which was the first of the Nikes, that was a, uh, a liquid propellant system. It was a little more hazardous to deal with. The, uh, the Nike system was a faster, had more altitude, uh, and a solid propellant capability. <coughs> So it wasn't as hazardous to work with uh, as far as uh, the missile launch guys. Um, so that just about wraps it up. Um, I do want to add um, one little one little thing. Phil did mention already the Nike Hercules um, was itself a 
nuclear weapon. Um, so you can see in this diagram, you've got the, the rocketry stuff um, down at the bottom, all the fuel and oxidizer, um, the propellant. You have the missile body in the second stage of it. Um, you have the guidance, that was the electronics that was receiving the signals that Phil was mentioning. And then in between, you had the warhead. It could be high explosive or it could be nuclear. So yes, here in Anchorage, in what is now Kincaid Park, um, there were about um, 72 nuclear weapons. Um, there is, um, in these bunkers, there are about 12 missiles per bunker. Um, each site had two bunk, um, each site had two, um, two, two, two bunkers, but um, Kincaid had two of everything, so it had double the numbers. Um, so this would be 48 at Kincaid, but um, well over 100 here in the, in the Anchorage area, as well as in Fairbanks. Kincaid Park in particular is of interest because that is over in Prime, Ligger, Clay Cove, soil formation, right? So during the earthquake of 1964, um, remember Nike was operational from 1959 to 1979, so during the 64 earthquake, um, the weapons did in some cases get knocked off of their, um, off of their um, casings. Um, some of the rockets actually achieved separation, um, the two stages separated from each other. So we, have, so we have these nuclear weapons inside of these giant concrete bunkers with um, fuel having spilled all over the place. So it's a super, super hazardous situation. Um, the Alaska earthquake could have been a lot worse um, than, than anybody could have imagined. Um, but they, they did um, get in control of the situation. They had to, all the soldiers there had to be um, on site for like 72 hours um, with no rig. They got hold of it. Um, they actually won a, the unit earned a medal for meritorious achievement, but because the Nike was at the time a secret, they couldn't tell anybody why <laughs> why they got the um, why they got the award. Um, it was just fairly recently declassified. We actually um, they, there is now over at King Cave there's a plaque um, talking about the history of the of the Nike site during the earthquake and commemorating um, the achievements of that unit. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, that's the end. Um, the Cold War ended in 1989, and like I said, most of the technology um, kind of went away. Um, for, uh, for those of you that spent a little time over at King King Park, because I, you know, I spent a lot of time there. So, I had, of course, it's changed. Uh, Pier Panel Lake's still there. Uh, we uh, we kind of christened that. Uh, but uh, it, the, the, uh, the missile barns are still there. If you get an opportunity to walk around there, there's four missile barns. Um, and as you're coming into where the ski chalet is, the ski rental, that is one of the missile barns where, where they rent skis. And then the big chalet, they've taken the front of that missile barn off and built that building onto the front of that. But if you're standing in front of that chalet looking down into the valley, there's two other missile barns that you can actually walk down to. Uh, so uh, there, there's some history there. They, of course, they've destroyed the barracks. They took it out. They took all the radar towers out. Uh, kind of broke my heart when they did that. But uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, history there and the fact that those missile barns are still there. And the old warhead buildings. Now, those are the, the ones that are buried underground. You've probably seen them as you're driving in. That's where the warheads that weren't mounted in the missiles, that's where they were kept. Was in those more good, along with other paint and other things. <laughs> of course, I shouldn't mention paint was in there, but it really wasn't. But, uh, I guess I used one of them for paint, but uh, they were designed to, to store the, the war hits. So there's some history out there for those of you that uh, want to walk around out there. Yeah. Uh, if, if you're familiar with Kinkade Park, uh, the uh, wind plots, the dog agility area over by the World Cup start, that's where the radars were. And if you look closely, you can, you can actually see the footprints of an old building. So if you've ever been out there and wondered, now you know. If you want to go to an intact um, Nike Hercules site, um, come with us. We will take you up the mountain. Um, friends of Nike Site Summit, as I said, does, um, does tours every summer. We are booked solid this year, but we would, we're not booked solid this year. Still six spots left. Um, for August. <laughs> And about uh, 20 spots for September, um, and then we'll have another set of tourists um, next year. Um, so I think we can take a few questions. If anybody has them, yes, sir. Um, 
Okay, so the, so the question was if, if a plane, if you can stop a plane relatively easily, why not just use missiles all the time? Um, so the answer is that that is what happened. Um, so we sort of went in backwards order historically. Um, so the first arm or leg of the strategic trying to come on was air based, um, just because they couldn't build rockets um, powerful enough um, in the 40s and 50s. Once, and in fact, once ICBMs and reconnaissance kind of ballistic missiles started coming online in the 60s, Nike kind of became obsolete. Um, the the site in Alaska were actually the last to be decommissioned, along with one down in Florida. Um, all the rest down in the lower 48 were decommissioned in the um, mid 70s. Um, ours lasted until 1979. Um, kept open for a few years longer, basically because of concerns that um, a shorter range aircraft could sort of try to come in under the radar from the Soviet Union, and then the one that in Florida um, was kept open because of the potential of um, planes coming over from Cuba. Um, but, but that's exactly right. Because airplanes are relatively easy to stop, if you can do a missile instead, you wouldn't, and that's what we both started. We, meaning the United States and Soviet Union, both started doing it in the 60s. The Nike system was the last line of defense. The uh, planes at 2019 came down, came down first, and Nike was designed for formation of the aircraft, not for service. Hence the nuclear warhead. So they, say, they always say, like, close only counts in Portuguese and hand grenades. It also counts um, when, you have a, when you have a nuclear battle. Just had, just had to get to the middle of formation. Um, it didn't have to actually hit an individual plane. Um, any other? Yes. The, the question is, was it accurate enough to um, to hit an individual plane? The, the, uh, the It was the radars that made this system obsolete. They couldn't track an ICBM with these radars. The missile itself, if if those of you have a big interest in our the, what was called the safeguard system, it was the follow-up of the Nike that uh, Nixon, when he signed the SALT II treaty, he put a stop to all of it. But if you go into Western Electric or AT&T, 20-year archives, ABM system, you'll see the safeguard system with the Spartan and Sprint missile. These, these, this system, this safeguard system was shown to the Russians in actual uh, operation and they signed the SALT II treaty. That's how effective the ABM system was, it, it, the safeguard system. The Sprint missile could catch a uh, uh, what, just watch this video. You won't believe the speed of these Sprint missiles. But it, 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 uh, they invited the Russians over to watch uh, the firing at Kwajalein Island. They launched ICBMs out of the Midwest and knocked them down with this system. And they signed the SALT II treaty after that. We initially were going to build 12 of these sites. In fact, that's kind of how I lost my job. I was scheduled to go to the school on the MSR, which was a missile site radar. And when Nixon signed the SALT II treaty, he canceled my orders, and I was really heartbroken because I thought I was going to get some really late technology, but as it turned out, it didn't work for me. But they were going to build 12 of these sites. They only built uh, one that was full operational. That was in Grand Forks, North Dakota. They, uh, the treaty allowed them to keep that one and to build one outside of Washington, D.C., but they decided not to do it. There is one at Kwajalein that's used for tests. Uh, it's still partially operational. But if you go to the 20-year archive, because AT&T, Western Electric, is the one that built this system, uh, Mom built. And uh, if you go to YouTube, everything's on YouTube. Uh, if you go to YouTube and look up the uh, AT&T 20-year archive for the ABM system, there's a full, it's about an hour long, so it's pretty lengthy. But it shows you the ABM system, the Sprint and Spartan missile, which is the Follow up from the Nike group. Hey guys, before you go, we just wanted to present you with a Science Pub mug, a pint glass, and some certificates. Ivan, thank you so much, you guys. We really appreciate it. And we also got some $25 gift cards and chapters. Thank you guys.
So guys, we're going to start serving cake here, and we're going to bring up our singer, Regina and Tom. We're going to do some music for you guys. So if you stick around, we appreciate it. Just give us a couple minutes. Thanks.